What is the law? The law of one. Namaste. Namaskaram. Now let us discuss the Montauk tribe. Chapter 7. It is now appropriate in our investigation to ask the following question. Exactly who was this tribe that was declared extinct and what was their heritage? According to a book by Vern Dyson titled Heather Flower and Other Indian Stories of Long Island, the Indian population of Long Island was about 5,000 when white settlers began arriving in the 1600s. Different sources indicate there were originally 13 main tribes. Each group had its own sachem, that is chief, who presided at tribal meetings and served as judge and executive officer. It is an undisputed historical fact that the royal or ruling tribe were the Montauks. Some accounts even suggest that the domain of the Montauks even extended far beyond Long Island. As the white man began to arrive, the Sachim of the Montauks was Mongatsitsi or Long Knife. He had four sons, Hogatakut, Wyandanch, Noe Diona, and Momowets. They ruled the Hogatak Indians, the Montauks, the Shinecocks, and the Kortshogs, respectively. These chiefs formed a powerful and famous organization known as the Four Federated Brothers. They were the famous sons of a famous father. It can clearly be seen from this information that all of these tribes were indeed Montauk Indian. The courts have considered them all separately in what could be considered an apparent attempt to denigrate the good name of the Montauks. Weyland Danch inherited his father's role and became the most famous of all the Indians. He was known as the wise speaker. According to Dyson, Weyland Danch selected Montauk as his royal headquarters. He also stated that the word Montauk means fortified place. Dyson goes on to say that Weyland Danch built a stockade capable of sheltering 500 warriors. Although the Montauks were a peaceful tribe, the warriors were fierce and highly competent. Perhaps the most well-known incident in the history of the Montauks is the wedding of Wyandanche's daughter, Heather Flower. Known for her exquisite beauty, she was to be married to a young chief of the Shinnecocks in the spring of 1653. A great ceremony was to be held with elaborate preparations being made for prolonged festivities. Lion Gardner, Richard Smith, and other prominent Englishmen were invited. In the midst of the wedding, late at night, a fierce group of Narragansetts from Connecticut struck down the groom and the attending young men. Heather Flower was seized and taken prisoner. Wyon Donch's heart was broken. The warring chief Ninigrat wanted a ransom. Finally, Lion Gardner, a blood brother of Wyandanch, arranged for the return of Heather Flower. Afterwards, Wyandanch granted Gardner a huge tract of land on the north shore of Long Island. Gardner would soon sell it to Richard Smith and the area would eventually become Smithtown. It must be pointed out that the above account is the version of the conquering race. I have heard from different Native Americans that Lion Gardner manipulated the whole affair. After all, Someone had to tip off Chief Nanningrad that the Montauks would be sitting ducks during the wedding festivities. Whichever account is correct, Lion Gardner had great influence over the Indians, and this legacy carried on to his descendants. The Montauks seem to have eroded amongst the warm friendship of the politically influential Gardners. Later in the book, Dyson quotes a passage from Chronicles of East Hampton by David Gardner, which refers to the Montauk tribe as being reduced to a beggarly number of some 10 or 15 drunken and degraded beings. 
This passage was written in the 1850s when the Montauk Indians started to be moved out by Benson. As the statement is also false, it casts further doubt on the gardeners being friends of the Montauks at all. There was obviously another side to recorded history, and it was with this in mind that I approached the recognized tribal leader of the Montauks, Robert Cooper, or Bob, as he is generally known, a retired police detective. Bob Cooper has also been elected to the town council of East Hampton. Montauk is within the political confines of the town of East Hampton. I made it very clear from the beginning that I would not be asking him to accept the Montauk story or to get involved in the investigation. My intention with him would simply be to learn more about the Montauk tribe and to help them find the means with which to restore the rights to their ancient heritage. Bob had not heard of the Montauk books, but thought the story was interesting. As a policeman, he used to chase kids out of the bunkers years earlier and said that the underground seemed to go on endlessly. I was also struck by Bob Cooper's appearance. Although he is dark skinned, he does not look like what would be termed an African American. His features would coincide with an Atlantean, based upon the legends of some of the various races of Atlantis, or Polynesian appearance. Bob said that he is 98% Montauk Indian and that his genealogy can be proven. The pharaohs are his ancestors, and his great grandmother was the last queen of the Montauks. Her name was Edith Banks Cooper, and he remembered her speaking of constant threats and demoralization concerning the Montauks and their land. It was her dream to be recognized as a native of America. It is Bob's intention to get the Montauks legal recognition and to restore some of their most sacred ground. His friends and fellow Montauks sometimes question why he would take on such a seemingly impossible task. The truth is that he is inspired by his ancient ancestors and sometimes wakes up from his sleep with a mission. It is not an easy task. What I found most impressive about Bob Cooper is that he does not want the land so that the Montauks can sell tobacco and have gambling casinos. His goal is to synchronize minds through an environmental consciousness and by example, to teach all native peoples to live indigenously. This is what the Montauks would use the land for. He has obviously chosen a position of leadership that is worthy of his royal ancestor. Bob said that the Montauks have been displaced from their own world and that according to tradition, they must return home before all of us can leave to the next world. The symbology is in direct alignment with what I have discovered researching the Montauk project. The sacred grid point of Montauk must be taken out of the hands of secret forces and brought to the forefront of the consciousness of all mankind. As for the court case, he said they were very interested in turning around the decision that declared the Montauks extinct. It requires a lawyer who understands Indian law and is not in, interested in the case for his own profit. At this point, such a lawyer has not been forthcoming. He also told us that a top Indian lawyer once said, the best case in the nation is that of the Montauks. Unfortunately, this lawyer has not been able to take the case on for personal reasons. If anyone is interested in contributing to this, case, to this cause, they can write to the Friends of the Pharaohs, care of Bob Cooper, PO Box 126, East Hampton, New York, 11937-0126. Perhaps the most intriguing thing I learned from talking to Bob Cooper is the Non-Intercourse Act of 1793. This legislation was passed early in American history and stated that any land that was owned by the federal government upon being dispossessed reverts back to the original owners. This makes the entire question of who owns Camp Hero much more complicated. If the government were at any point to give up ownership of the land, it should revert to the Montauk tribe. Unfortunately, the Montauks have been declared extinct by the New York State Supreme Court. If this case were ever overturned, the Montauks claim to their land would be very hard to dispute. The next order of business was to search out the deed for Camp Hero and discover who actually owned the land. Below is a triangular shaped pond situated to the northeast and just on the other side of Industrial Road from Fort Pond. At first glance, it appears to be an extension of that body of water. However, 
several people have reported that it is bottomless. No one disputes that it is very deep. There is an ancient legend that a member of the Montauk Nation whose reputation was ruined and life forfeited by some act of crime fled to this location, placed his foot on a rock, and sprang forward into a valley which opened to receive him. As the earth closed behind him, a spring gushed forth from which never ceased. A permanent footprint was left on the rock, which has since been removed from the area. There were reportedly three such rocks at Montauk, sometimes identified as the devil's hoofprint. It has been speculated that the ceaseless spring became this bottomless pond. Well, folks, that is further explorations into the pyramids of Montauk. That was chapter seven. Refreshments are available. Um, stay tuned. We'll be journeying much further into the mystery of the pyramids of Montauk. Keep in mind, there is a lot involved. There's some very heavy duty stuff involved in this uh, exploration. So stay tuned and stay hydrated. Namaste. Namaskaram.